Dana, I, I see that your camera's turned off. Do you want to do any, do you, do you have any announcements or anything as, um, as we get started? You're on mute. There you go. No, Cindy, I don't. I know we're tight for time. So, you know, our obviously people in Birmingham are, and Mobile are interested in their municipal elections today. So we'll go from this to that. Um, and we need, you know, I know the panel's going to talk about our next steps in terms of redistricting. So I don't have anything else so that we, I don't take up too much time on the agenda tonight. Okay, great. And that is Dana Ellis, the president of the board of the uh, League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. So thank you, Dana. And I, and she brings up a great point. There are municipal elections happening today in Birmingham and Mobile. If you have not voted yet, please turn off your camera and turn off your computer and go vote. I'm sure that if you're on this call, you probably already have voted, but we would totally forgive you if you somehow forgot and need to go vote. Because <laughs> that is the most important act that we, um, that we promote here with the league. But assuming that everyone has voted where you can, um, we will go ahead and get started with our program. So, my name is Cindy Lowry and I am a, uh, the Vice President of the Board of League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. And I am um, hopefully like many of you learning about redistricting and the work that the League is doing and, and other organizations in the state are doing around redistricting in Alabama. And we were um, fortunate enough to find this film that we're really excited about to show you that that's going to kind of kick off our discussion tonight. So we hope that you'll stay with us through the film watching and the um, the rest of the discussion afterward, because I think it's going to be very robust and very enlightening to see how we can, uh, what's going on with redistricting in Alabama and what gerrymandering and redistricting is all about. So tonight we're very excited to have um, Robert Millman with us. And Robert is the maker of the film. Uh, he's the co-creator co of the film with uh, his daughter. And I, in my notes, I did not put her name down. Robert, can you- Rachel. Can you share? Rachel. And the film is called Line in the Street. And there is a website about the film. There's an, actually an hour long version that we're not gonna watch tonight. We're gonna watch the 30 minute version. But there is an hour long version you can also go and watch if you go to the website and, and uh, check that out. So we hope that you will share this with, with others and um, spread the word. After the film, we'll have um, speaker, uh, speakers to talk about what's going on in Alabama. Robin Bucklew of the League of Women Voters of Alabama and the Tennessee Valley uh, chapter of League of Women Voters is with us tonight, who has been doing this work for a long time and is very educated and very I've learned a lot in just short conversations I've had with Robin, so we're excited to have Robin with us. And let me see if Felicia's on the call yet. Do we see Felicia? Yes, there's Felicia. Felicia Scalzetti is with the Alabama Election Protection Network and Crowd Redistricting Fellow um, assigned to the Birmingham region of, of the state and, and also the Wiregrass. So she's got a big job with, with her redistricting work. So she's also gonna be with us to talk about what's going on in Alabama. So this is an experiment we're doing because we did say we're gonna watch a movie and we are gonna watch a movie, but you're gonna to have to listen to our instructions in order to do that. <laughs> so um, if we don't have any other announcements from, from the league, we're going to, I'm gonna put a, a link in the chat feature. So if you are able to access the chat, so if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a word that says chat and you can double click on it and it pulls up a box. And the box will show you a white clicking screen and a screen where people have written things. Oh, and I just pasted the wrong thing. Hold on, let me get my link pasted. So we're gonna go and watch the video on another link, not in Zoom, because Zoom is not a great place to watch videos. If you've ever watched movies in Zoom, now maybe if you're just watching a video that doesn't have words, it just has pictures, that's fine. But if you're trying to follow words and pictures at the same time, Zoom makes it choppy and it makes it difficult to follow. And as from, I, I know a little bit, of, I have some friends that are filmmakers and I know how they cringe when they have to see their films on Zoom. So we are experimenting with this process, um, which I have done with another organization one time. So I have very limited experience, but I just posted a link in the chat. It's a Vimeo link. And if you click on that, 
or copy and paste it into your browser on your computer, you go out and watch the video. And when I give you the go ahead, we're all gonna go out and watch that video. What I would recommend that you do is keep your Zoom screen there, keep your Zoom logged in, turn off your camera as many of you already have and turn off your sound and go watch the video on your own, uh, uh, on this link. And then um, we're gonna give that enough time. It's a 30 minute video. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna have our discussion. And so does anyone have, does everyone understand that? First of all, if you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, if you're not able to access the chat, please come off of mute now and, and let me know that you're not understanding what I'm saying. All right, in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and just kind of start easing back into the conversation. And hopefully folks are finishing up the film. I know it's, um, everybody kind of had their own pace. So hopefully you got to see most of it. If for some reason you came in late, which I think a couple of people did, and you only got to see about half the film in this amount of time, we hope you'll come and join us on Zoom here for the discussion and maybe pause your video and you can go watch it, uh, the rest of it at the end um, after we're finished talking. Because I think the discussion is going to be really robust and exciting. Um, so I just kind of want to start with, um, talking to the filmmaker, Robert Millman, who's with us today from New York. He is, he is not an Alabamian, but um, I have had many conversations with him over the last couple of weeks preparing for this and was impressed with the film when he reached out to us to, to maybe use it in our programming to really help uh, explain this issue and the importance of it. So Robert, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to make this film? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, glad to. So uh, I, I, I made the film because uh, gerrymandering is, is foundational. Uh, it, it kind of is, it, it, it's the reason behind really the sort of uh, uh, sequestered uh, uh, dysfunction that our politics are living through right now. Uh, and in, in looking at it, uh, it, it, it's not just foundational, uh, it is frankly illegal. Uh, uh, and, and, and that really is the whole point of the film is that uh, the, the gerrymandering is the sorting and selecting of voters by legislators. And that violates the plain language uh, rights in, in all 50 state constitutions. Uh, I'm from New York. It violates it in New York. It violates it in Alabama. Uh, you know, the the my 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 reasoning, you know, quite simply, is that you, the individual right to vote exists in state constitutions. It's in the plain language of your state constitution. The other thing that's in your state constitution is the right to equal treatment, equal protection, equal justice different constitutions use different language, but they all say the same thing. The, the vote is supposed to be supposed to be equal. So my, my effort is to uh, uh, really change the perspective, uh, to, to change the framing of the issue, because the, the people who benefit from this uh, rigging of elections through, through election districts, uh, they want to keep it secret and they want to keep it complicated. Uh, and they would rather talk about anything other than the basics. So I'm trying to hark back to the, the really the absolute basics, which is that the, the right to vote is a de facto national right. It's in all 50 state constitutions in plain language. And while the language varies, uh, all 50 state constitutions enumerate uh, a, a right to equal treatment of the law. So voting is the law, equal treatment is the law, gerrymandering is, is wrong. And uh, they, the, the, the film was about events that took place in Pennsylvania because they came up with a, a wonderfully simple uh, uh, solution. First, they challenged gerrymandering on state constitutional rights, not on federal rights, on state constitutional rights. And the, the, the decision was, was really kind of remarkably simple and understandable, which was do not divide any county, city, town, borough, or township except where necessary to, to ensure equality of population. It, it is such an elegantly simple solution to 
uh, of the way that that politicians and legislators can game the system through this what is essentially uh, a math trick, uh, just by requiring that uh, uh, the political subdivisions, as in towns, counties, boroughs, townships, those sort of things, that you simply split the fewest of them. Um, it's simple. It's not a perfect solution, but I, I don't think Americans want a perfect solution. They want a workable solution. They want a kind of rough justice. And, and, and that's what, that's what uh, that solution is. Uh, I made the film specifically about Pennsylvania because they were the first ones to uh, pursue this specifically on state constitutional rights. Um, and also it is to date the only example where an entire congressional delegation was rewritten uh, based on state constitutional rights. So I, I thought it functions as, as a, a, a model. Uh, and, you know, not everyone is going to win in, in, in the court of law, but the other court is the court of public opinion. And, and, and that's the court we all have. Well, we certainly um, are familiar with constitutional um, issues here in Alabama. <laughs> I think none of us are um, are unaware of the challenges of our state constitution. And there's some good things in it, as you mentioned, and there's also some challenging things. And it is the longest constitution in the world, as far as we know, because of all of the amendments. But it is... Um, it is something that we've discussed that I've just recently learned in conversations with you in this video and in conversation or this film and in conversations with some of our other speakers that I'll introduce in a moment about what's going on in Alabama and the idea that um, you know our county governments don't have home rule and our local governments don't have home rule within our constitution. So when you break up uh, the districts and many uh, many representatives represent one county or one municipality, then that makes it more challenging for, um, for local bills to pass. And that is something that is unfortunately a tactic here in Alabama for many issues because local governments have no home rule. So um, this is certainly pertinent to, to the subject of Alabama. And we really appreciate you bringing it to us. I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll introduce our panel, our other panels to kind of get a little more into what's going on specifically here in Alabama. But um, what impact do you hope that this film has in showing it around the country and showing it at, at various, in various um, groups like this? Um, what what I, my, my hope is that people will grasp the fundamental injustice and the fundamental easy solution that that, that exists, uh, 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 again, simply the act of demanding, and, and I don't use that word lightly, demanding that legislators uh, split the fewest possible number of counties, towns, boroughs, townships, that would solve 90% of the problem. And all of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the sequestration of, of people only looking at their form of news or, or their form of, of, uh, uh, of, of political support uh, that, that, that really effect, is affected directly by, by gerrymandering. It, it's a way that you don't have to talk to or deal with, uh, uh, with other people. And uh, uh, I'm 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 not sure if I if I if I answered your question, but I'm I'm hoping that someone in this audience, because you never know who people know, uh, might uh, uh, be able to help uh, get this word out on on a bigger level. I've I've worked on this for four years now, and uh, mostly I have a flat spot on my head for my efforts, but uh, um, I know that winning is possible. Uh, this is a sort of a, a brief war story, but New York State votes with paper ballot optical scan, largely because of a film I made more than 10 years ago. So I, I know what winning tastes like, and it's possible and, and winning tastes great. Thank you. So I'm putting the link to your um, website in the chat. Um, if folks do want to, there is a longer version of the film. And um, if folks want to reach out to 
Robert or show the film in another part of your, another network that you're involved in, please feel free to do that. So I wanna move on to talk oh, with- excuse, excuse me, Cindy, could I ask one question of the group, of, yes. of, of the audience? Is there anybody watching who is not from Alabama? I'm just curious if any of my posting on Twitter engaged anyone from outside Alabama. And, and if you do, please just, just make a note in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the chat, thank you. I see we've got Elizabeth from South Carolina and Cheryl from Wisconsin and Terry from Massachusetts. Thank you guys for joining us. That's a great question. Thank you for alerting us that we have folks from other states. We really appreciate you guys joining us. And I know that um, if you don't, if you guys don't know anything about Alabama, um, maybe we'll we'll learn a little bit tonight about what's going on here with and and how folks are trying to change things here, just like like everyone is everywhere um, in this subject matter. So we have Robin Buckaloo um, with the League of Women Voters of Alabama and also the, the Tennessee Valley chapter. And we also have Fel uh, Felicia Scalzetti, who I keep losing on my Zoom screen, but I'm pretty sure she's still here. There you go, there's Felicia. Um, with Election Reform Network, and she is a crowd fellow working on redistricting. So I'm gonna start um, with our panel discussion with, and, and got, you guys feel free to ask questions in the chat. And um, once we kind of go through a little set of questions that we have, we'll let you guys come off mute and, and talk with the panelists. But Robin, first, if you'll just talk to us about what's, you know, what are the basics of what's going on with redistricting in Alabama and the role that the league is playing. And um, I know that, that Robert's film really um, highlighted gerrymandering. And there's some very specific examples of where this is impacting um, real life in Alabama. And I'd love it if you'd share those things with us as well. First, a few basics, and I'll, I'll try to get through those. You know, redistricting in Alabama goes on at a lot of different levels. So the state legislature is responsible for redistricting the congressional districts, the state house districts, and the state senate districts. The members of the standing committee are appointed by the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor. That means that all of the members of the committee are appointed by Republican legislature, legislators. And you can imagine what the result of that is. Um, the committee is appointed solely by Republicans and the Democrats that are on the committee, as, as you saw in the film that we just, that we just witnessed, have as much incentive to hold on to their safe seats as the Republican legislators do. Now there are other district redistricting activities that go on in Alabama. Most of them are like self-licking ice cream cones. The county commissions redistrict themselves. The city councils redistrict themselves. The, the districts in which the school board members are elected as opposed to appointed, that's in uh, 20 cities in Alabama, um, the, the um, county school, excuse me, the county school board members are elected and the school districts are the same as the council districts in the cities in which the school board members are elected. So at all levels in Alabama, we have the incumbents in power drawing the lines for the next election. Um, I'm not gonna go into the, the uh, details of, of how all of those maps are drawn, but you ask how is the league participating in this and the league is participating at every level. We have people on in groups and, and coalitions looking at how the congressional uh, districts are being drawn. We have people going to local council meetings and looking at how the local districts are, are being drawn. I'm missing a meeting tonight in which uh, several people are discussing the ongoing efforts in the Huntsville City Council. 
I'm trying to cover all your the things that you were interested in, uh, Cindy. So well, also feel free to just share what you think we need to hear because I'm, okay. I'm just kind of uh, my questions are just kind of a guide. Yeah, one of the things that I ran into when I was looking at the the material that was available for tonight uh, is this interesting part of the Alabama code that says after the publication of a federal census of po population or a substantial change in the corporate limits. If any council district contains a population which is 10% or more or less than the total population of the city divided by the number of council districts, in other words, the average council population, then the council so, shall redistrict the boundaries in the following manner. Basically, the council comes up with a plan in six months and no, the mayor comes up with a plan in six months and the council has another six months to approve it. And after a year, then it goes into effect if the council approves it or not. If they don't come up with their own plan, the mayor's plan comes into law. This is in Alabama code and it provides for situations in which a population grows a lot in one part of a city or the city annexes a bunch of territory, which has been happening in Huntsville repeatedly over the last decade. So I brought it up because it was interesting to me that we haven't seen any of this redistricting activity in the city council areas. Um, let's see. Examples of where gerrymandering is impacting communities. One of the most egregious examples is in Birmingham, the 35th Street uh, Superfund site, which has yet to be cleaned up. And it was carefully gerrymandered so that it's contained entirely within the African-American State Representatives District, the African-American State Senators District, and the African-American Congressional Representative. That means there is no Republican in the state legislature or anywhere else in Alabama that is interested at all in cleaning up that site. And the median income in that, in that area is, is approximately half or less than the median income in Alabama. So it is a bunch of poor people that are being taken advantage of because they've been stuck into an area where nobody cares what happens to them. Uh, I think everybody is aware that Terry Sewell's district is similar to that odd district that we just saw in the film in Pennsylvania. It has portions of Montgomery. It has portions of Birmingham. It has portions of Mobile. And it has a zillion Black Belt voters stuffed into it. So, of course, it is overwhelmingly Democratic and therefore the, it leaves the Republicans to be divided up among the rest of the Alabama districts, which are safely Republican. So Alabama has approximately 40% Democratic voters, and it has 14% of the congressional seats are Democratic. Um, in Madison County, which almost would have elected a Democratic state senator in the 2018 election, uh, parts of the county were put into two other Senate districts. Most of the people that were stuffed into those Senate districts were Democrats. And then to make up the shortfall of 10,000 voters, 10,000 uh, voters in Limestone County were added into District 2. Um, the, the resulting vote in that district would have been a dead heat if Madison County had simply been the district instead of being split up and assigned Democrats to other senatorial state districts and then and then added in a bunch of Republicans from from Limestone County. So I think, well, I'm I'm using up enough time, but I would also submit that if you followed Robert's um, idea of whole counties <clears throat> being represented instead of being split up, Jefferson County being a, a great example because it's it's a Democratic county, but it doesn't have any, any um, 
real democratic representation because it it keeps getting divided up and and uh, cracked into safely Republican areas. But there are many counties in Alabama that that have lost their hospitals. There are places in Alabama where a pregnant woman has to go 100 miles to find a place to safely deliver. And I propose that if whole counties were left whole, either combined in, in severals or in cases of, of counties like Jefferson, um, left intact and maybe added in a couple of other counties to balance it out, that we would probably have passed Medicare expansion by now and we wouldn't have so many people Medicaid expansion that we wouldn't have so many people that don't have access to medical care. And now I'll be quiet in case anybody would like to ask a question. Yeah, so feel free to post questions in the chat. Um, I do wanna um, turn it over and introduce Felicia Spalzetti, who is, um, as I said, with Election Reform Network, and she is what's called a crowd filler, which is a new, a new term I'm learning about. It, this has really been fascinating to me because I just always thought that these decisions were made by the politicians, as, as Robin mentioned, they're made by the incumbents that are already elected, and we don't really have much that we can do about it and get involved in, but apparently we do, and there are people working on this. So Felicia, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about what you do as a crowd fellow, and then kind of what the infrastructure of what's, you know, all the different groups working on redistricting, it, it looks like, and, um, you know, sort of give us a little bit more of the lay of the land there of how regular people and citizens and organizations who care about these issues are getting involved. Yeah, I'd love to thank, thank you all for, for inviting me to talk. Um, I just have one favor to ask of all of you. My internet has been a little wonky today and I've noticed that my audio goes out for everybody else before everybody freezes for me, um, but I can still hear y'all. So if I suddenly, um, my mouth is moving and you can't hear me and I freeze, just say something with your hands. Um, I promise I will, I will, if I get jumped, you know, bumped out of the meeting, I will come right back. I will not leave y'all. Uh, just wanted to let you know that I am not <laughs> exiting suddenly. Uh, my internet is just being a bit of a bear today. All right, um, I'll, stay, I'll stay off mute so I can let you know if something happens. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am a crowd fellow and that is that stands for a community redistricting organizing uh, organizations working for democracy. Um, and yes, I had to write that down because I always forget what the acronym stands for. It's a program that the Southern Coalition for Social Justice put together. North Carolina has redistricted its state maps. 11 times in the last 10 years. So typically you do it once every 10 years after the census, their maps kept getting thrown out and Southern Coalition for Social Justice was on the front lines for a lot of that effort. And they decided that they wanted to take what they learned, um, you know, empowering citizens and communities to advocate for themselves in North Carolina and to take it across the South. You know, kind of Southerners teaching Southerners how to stand up to the same oppressive systems that we've all, you know, grown up and lived under for decades, um, generations. So what they did is that this is the inaugural program. Um, they are sponsoring uh, fellows in multiple Southern states. So I am one of the four fellows in Alabama specifically. There are fellows in South Carolina, um, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and I believe also Florida. So they are, you know, and each state has about three or four fellows a piece. In my case, I'm specifically sponsored by the Alabama Election Protection Network and TOPS to the Ordinary People Society. Um, the other groups that are working that are sponsoring fellows is the League of Women Voters. Um, the uh, fellow for them is uh, Stephanie uh, Barnett, um, and she works in North Alabama. Um, Shalila Dowdy is a fellow with the NAACP in Mobile, and she works in the southwest portion of the state. And Kadita Stone is the fellow for Alabama Forward, and she works on the Black Belt. And we all work together. Um, we talk constantly, we coordinate constantly, we try to, um, a lot of this work is statewide, as, as Robin mentioned, and a lot of it is regional when we come down to county commissioners and municipalities redistricting. And so we're kind of on board for the whole shebang. Um, right now, state maps are the urgent fire. Um, but as Robin mentioned, there are uh, municipalities that are currently redistricting as well. Huntsville is already moving forward and holding public hearings. Um, I live in Birmingham. I live in the South Side Birmingham and I voted today as I hope many of y'all did. Um, and you know, the people that we elect today or in the runoffs in October 
like Robin mentioned, those city councilors are going to redraw their own districts. Um, so that is why your vote today was really important and whoever you thought was the best representative for you, um, because unfortunately, we do not have an independent commission in Alabama. That is something that I really, really want to help put into place. Unfortunately, here it would it would require um, like a law or an amendment to the Constitution. Um, I think uh, Robert was mentioning how we should um, sue under state law, um, something that is uh, that we all know about Alabama, but that, that Robert may or may not know is that Alabama has the longest constitution uh, in the world because of the lack of home rule. Every time we want to pass some sort of local legislation, it gets on, added onto our constitution. So that makes a lot of things more difficult in Alabama, but I what I like to say as a pep talk is that we are used to things being hard in Alabama. We are used to organizing under this, you know, system under these circumstances, and we um, we know what winning here feels like. We know what we need to do. We know what our communities deserve. You know, the 35th Street North site um, needs uh, needs help. You know, we need we need to do better for ourselves, for our state, for our future. Um, that is, that is uh, I will put that soapbox aside and get down to the nitty gritty of, of what's happening right now. Um, so my goals overall as a crowd fellow, I've already mentioned that we are interested in, in municipal and, and local redistricting, but specifically um, we wanna connect, train, educate, and engage as many Alabamians as possible. Um, we want to empower community storytelling, empower community advocacy. So what I want to do is whatever resources and things that I learn um, to let y'all take that mantle on yourselves, to let you speak for yourselves. I don't wanna be a mouthpiece for anybody else. I want to give you the knowledge and tools that I have gotten um, and, and kind of spread that around. So in uh, Robin mentioned facilitating working groups. Um, yes, no, not crowd filler. <laughs> um, to facilitate local working groups, um, people who can collect stories in their communities, um, who can talk about how redistricting has harmed them, um, how their communities have been split, um, how this has led to a lack of representation. Um, I live in Congressional District 7. Um, I have, to this day, never been able to make it to a town hall meeting because there has never been one held uh, closer than two hours away from me. And it has just never been possible in my schedule to take two hours there, two hours for a town hall, and two hours back in my schedule. It just has not been able to happen. Um, we are told that if you want to see change in your you know, in your representation that you should get involved, that you should attend these things. These are parts of being a good civic, you know, good parts of civic engagement. But if you cannot physically or geographically access that, you know, what are you supposed to do at that point? You know, and I don't have a child, I have a car. Um, those are points of access that a lot of people don't have. Um, which uh, brings me to what is happening right now. So next week, starting on Wednesday, um, public hearings are going to be held throughout the state of Alabama. These are going to be held by the reapportionment committee. They're going to hold four meetings a day um, over the course of seven days. The seven days are spread out over the first two weeks of September. The problem with these meetings is that they're held on weekdays and during working hours. For example, Mobile is, um, has a meeting at nine in the morning on, I think, like a Monday or Tuesday. There are not a lot of people especially not working people who can go to a 9 a.m. meeting on redistricting on a Tuesday. Um, the meetings most relevant to us here in, in Birmingham um, are gonna be Thursday, September 2nd at 4 p.m. at Lawson State and Tuesday, September 7th at 2 p.m. Um, all meetings are going to be virtually broadcast on Microsoft Teams. We are also concerned about that platform because many of us, including myself, have never used it before. And we won't really know until the first hearing how that actually goes. We've been told that any comments that you make in the chat on the virtual uh, video will be recorded in the public record. You also have the option of submitting public testimony ahead of time um, by emailing it to the clerk. So we, they are also holding meetings in person. As far as we know, the reapportionment committee themselves will not be showing up in person. They will be videoing in. There is the option for local reps to maybe show up to their own meetings. So there has been concern that should they want, 
they could just cut the feed. Um, there, it's, it's a little more difficult to hold people accountable when you have that kind of, you know, virtual distance. Um, as a result uh, of, of all these barriers, the fellows and I, the other three fellows, or, you know, the four of us collectively have decided we're going to hold a town hall every night there's a public hearing. So on September 1st, 2nd, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 15th and 16th, which are all days that public hearings are gonna be held by the legislators, we are going to, each one of those nights, hold a town hall on Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. where we will catch everybody up on what the legislators have said that day, um, provide a space for people to um, ask questions, give feedback, um, find out what next steps are. We will um, be teaching people how to testify, how to submit testimony, um, what they can do to, to get involved, um, what this means for them, because we expect many people will not be able to go to the meetings during the day at all. Um, and, and just generally do the legislators jobs for them, essentially. Uh, I know that I've thrown out a lot of dates, a lot of meeting types. Um, I will be, um, you know, I, I will send Cindy um, everything written down and, and resources. Um, we, the fellows are trying to put together a testimony training, um, something like a one page sheet or like a, like a guide, um, that is written down. Um, crowd has resources that they use in North Carolina. We just need to update them for Alabama. Um, and those should be coming through, I think tomorrow or so, um, we're still working on those. So we will distribute those, uh, to y'all as soon as possible as well. Can you record? testimony to turn in. Sorry, I see a question. Um, do you mean a video recording, Kathy? Is that what you're yes, referring to? Yes, I was, that's what I was thinking. I, I thought, what a great idea for you to hold those town halls. If you could, if you're I recording think. that, then you could turn it in to the reapportionment committee. So I actually, I have, um, I'm just trying to see, I believe they just say written. There was actually a question about this with Anisha earlier. So, so Kathy and, and Robin have both been on. There are bi-weekly reapportionment. Uh, there's a, a redistricting coalition. There are a lot of groups that have come together to try to make a genuine statewide effort um, when it comes to redistricting. You know, there are a lot of people that have cared for this for a number of years. But as far as I'm aware, this is the first time we've really had a statewide coordinated effort to try to respond to maps um, in 2010. I believe it was, uh, they waited until maps were, were drawn and submitted, and then there was legal action taken afterwards, um, as opposed to trying to get into this process early. Um, that, that's, so Anisha and I, uh, Anisha is, uh, uh, works with Alabama Values, which is a, um, a communications hub. We've been developing how to get this information out to people easily and like kind of a one-stop event. We talked about recording um, even selfie videos and things like that. As far as we know, they might not be submittable to the committee itself, but um, I mean, I, I, I don't think it hurts. It's also very, very, that's great things to put online to show people what that looks like. Um, we are planning on recording the town halls as well because I suspect things will be said or you know, there'll be moments that we might want to clip out and, and showcase later and say, like, this is why you should get involved or, you know, we didn't know this was happening in this district or this town. So it gives us a chance to have like that listening session as well. Um, you know, Robin talked about the 35th Street North site. I know about that because I live in Birmingham. I cover, I think, 18 counties. Um, I haven't been to all of them physically. I'm going to Dothan this weekend. It's going to be the first time I ever have gone to Dothan. Um, there is, uh, there's just, there, there's a lot of territory. Alabama's quite big, um, even though it might not look it. To keep track of all of these individual places, to know what that, those little, the Superfund site is not little, but to know what the concern is in that community is really important when you're drawing maps. Um, because otherwise you, you don't know what the context is. You know, you could draw out uh, a district around the 35th Superfund site. There's nothing on a, on a, on, on a map, you know, in the mapping software that tells you, you know, alert, alert, this is a super fun site, or this is, a, this is an area where like, there's been a lot of litigation, you know, I could look at a county that I've never been to, and I wouldn't know that something like that existed, unless somebody in the community tells me. 
and that's why this this kind of communication is is really important. I know my area pretty well. I know Southside very well. I know Birmingham pretty well. I know Jefferson County pretty well. I know Shelby kind of. The further out you go, the Rob, let me gets. ask Robin real quick if um or Jean or I, I pardon my ignorance about the the various leagues. Is there a league in the southeastern in the Wiregrass part of the state? Is there a league chapter there? There's a league in Dothan. There, yes, it's a, it's a member at large unit, but yes, they're on they're they're in the process of becoming a full fledged local league. Yes. So those but I those contacts might be really helpful to you, Felicia, if you don't already have it. Yeah, I don't I don't think that includes what what you're calling the wiregrass area because you know, I, I, I this is Linda Turner and, and uh, I'm on for the league tonight in Dothan and a wiregrass area. Oh, okay. But others couldn't okay. make it. <laughs> yeah, <excellent. laughs> well. So Felicia and Lynn, maybe Linda Turner, y'all need to be communicating. That'd be great. That would, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just put my contact information in there for anybody who wants it. I'm still learning a whole lot. Linda, what counties do you guys cover? It's pretty much all of District 2, uh, Senate, I'm, I'm sorry, U.S. Congress, Congressional District. We got 13 total. Uh, so there's Houston County, Henry County, Geneva County, Dale County, Coffee County. Uh, where's the one over in Andalusia? What's Covington? Uh, yep, those are all mine. Yeah, those, and I can't think, I know there's more, but those are the ones that I can remember right now. Uh, Pike. Pike, yes. And okay. Barber. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. Part Sorry, of not, to, not to be naming counties while everybody <laughs> just stands here riveted. I apologize. No, that's okay. I think this is a great connection. I hope it, I mean, if you guys didn't already know each other, I hope this will be helpful. Well, um, Lisa, I think one of the most exciting things that the crowd fellows are involved in and, and several other groups is the idea of letting communities of interest identify themselves, going out and talking to people. And I wish that you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's so that's been an ongoing effort. There have been there have been difficulties, first of all, with COVID. Um, we got a slight reprieve over the summer. The Cry Fellows were kind of getting their legs under them and, and trying to get a uh, lay of land, understand what our roles were. Um, and I think it we all really regret those like three or four weeks because it feels like we missed a window to be going out in communities personally. I, I know I am concerned and several other, the other fellows are also concerned as well as member groups that we are kind of reaching some of the same people when we only have things online. There are lots of people in Alabama who do not have internet access or city internet access or the knowledge to get on Zoom who would go to an in-person meeting. And yet I feel like I'd be putting people in harm's way by holding an in-person meeting. I'm personally struggling with, and you might've noticed, I did not tell you whether to go in person or virtually because I don't feel comfortable telling people what risk they should take themselves um, in, in terms of going to the public hearings. So when it comes to identifying communities of interest, we sort of have one hand tied behind our backs because I'm sort of left only with digital outreach. The good news is that I'm actually a digital organizer. So I have some knowledge of how to maneuver in that space and how to actually reach people. But even still, it's not ideal, but we're gonna do what we gotta do with this is this is the this is the you know situation we were handed with and we're gonna make some lemonade out of it. Um, when it comes to identifying communities of interest, the way we started, most of us was asking um, our, you know, the orgs that were representing us, what areas have they been working in the most? Um, the other lens that I've used to like identify communities of interest is areas that we've organized around. For example, I haven't talked about prison gerrymandering yet. Um, just out of, out of curiosity, um, does anybody here know what I'm talking about when I say prison gerrymandering? I'm, I know Robin does, but does anybody else know what I mean when I say prison ger gerrymandering? Okay, prison gerrymandering is um, the act of using a prison's population of incarcerated people to artificially boost the number of people counted in your district. So in Alabama, we have the highest rate of incarceration in the US. We have the highest number of people per capita behind bars and the majority of them are black. 
what this means in, in reality is that because these facilities are located in rural and usually white towns, small towns, when the census counts people, they count inmates as living in the district that the jail is located in. So this does not matter how long you've been in that facility. If it's the night that the census is, is, is you know, the census count is being taken, you get counted there and not at your home address. If you were in the drunk tank, that night, if you were serving a one week sentence for, I don't know, running too many red lights, you might have gotten counted somewhere that was not your home address. What this does is systematically take political and economic power from urban and more diverse areas like Jefferson County, like Birmingham specifically, and transfer it out to Shelby, to Bibb, to um, Etowah, to any place that you have mass incarceration facilities. This, this also happens on a smaller scale with jails as well. But just to th think in your head where uh, prisons are, and then understand that any one of those facilities, they're counted as residents of whatever county or municipality that is. So this is, a, like I said, a systematic drain. So um, last year, or really six months ago, there was a grassroots effort to oppose three new mega prisons being built. Those organizers are also very interested in prison gerrymandering. That's sort of a non-traditional community of interest. These communities came together and said, we don't want this prison in our backyard. They didn't know about prison gerrymandering, but that's another aspect to it. So I've been going back to them and trying to reconnect with those organizers and say, hey, I know you are organizing around this issue and that you care about incarceration in Alabama. Here's another part of it that you might not have realized is actually connected to redistricting. How do we support you in doing this? Because right now in the state of Alabama, we would have to pass a law to reapportion people counted in incarcerate, that are incarcerated back into their home districts. Um, and that would be, again, a huge boon for um, urban areas and for um, any diverse areas. That's, that's exactly where the drain is happening. Um, so that would be I know that was a that was a very successful organizing group. So that sounds like some great folks to be reaching out to because yeah. we were involved a little bit. I was involved a little bit in that with another organization. But I do want to. I, I hate to interrupt because this no, is please. so much we could talk about with this. Um, but I want to offer for the last um, like nine or ten minutes we have here, if folks on the call have quest specific questions, because I know we've kind of thrown a lot of information at you. So if you uh, want to post in the chat or if you want to come off of mute. Um, I will try my best to manage that. If you want to come off of mute and ask a question about um, redistricting, about gerrymandering, about what's going on with these hearings coming up in the next couple of weeks, how you can be more, how you can learn more, um, just whatever you want to ask. Oh, um, Cindy, can I just add one quick thing? The, the, the film opens with a pennies and dimes demonstration. Um, that is available to anyone who wants it. Just contact me and I'll send you a downloadable link. Thank you. This is not usually a shy group, so I know you're sitting out there thinking about questions you want to ask. Cindy, one thing I was going to mention, you had posted in the comments the link to the public hearing schedule. Um, I'm going to repost it just so people are, it's easy to find. That schedule shows the date, time, and place of the meetings, and Felicia mentioned the two particularly relevant in, in our area, the legal women, the greater Birmingham area. In addition, the, the link to join the meeting virtually um, is there too. So I wanted to draw attention to that. I think Felicia's right. People have to make their own decision about attending in person or virtually. And this schedule shows you both ways to do that. Thank you, Dana. So I, mm -hmm. I have, a, there is a question um, that someone posted in the chat and, and maybe this is, I'm gonna put this one to Robin first. And what what is the league testifying at these hearings? What specific talking points is the league gonna have um, at these hearings? You're on mute, sorry. I think one of the things, and I, really Kathy should speak for this since she's state president, but I think one of the, the things that the league is emphasizing is the whole county um, aspect, not splitting counties up in order to 
to dilute their representation because we have this unique situation in Alabama? Um, I can I can answer it. Follow on to what Robin just said is we have a um, an alternate map that we're going to present at the at the uh, meeting at the meetings at least to the very first one, which is I think scheduled here in Huntsville. But we'd like to carry it to other locations, and we're going to send try to get the map into other local league hands so that they can show it at their local league at the areas where they're at. And uh, that would be a congressional map that maintains county boundaries. We think that's very, very important. Um, it's still under review. We were looking for community comment and we're talking to Felicia and the other fellows about getting some, some in-depth review on that map. But um, the points we're gonna make are that we, we feel like the reapportionment committee should tr respect traditional boundaries, which are county boundaries, and that that we need to improve minority representation across across the congressional districts to to um, basically provide an additional representation and then maintain one person one vote and then we're going to show the map and I guess we understand there's like three minutes to talk um, that's um that's going to be tough to do that in that short a period of time but but um that's that's where the state's coming down for the for these September meetings. And uh, of course, we also feel the same way about the, about the state house and state Senate that we need to maintain county boundaries. Um, to add on to Kathy's point about it being too short to talk about in a meeting, something that crowd told us, um, and this is an option um, was to, and I, again, this was, this was North Carolina advice. I don't know how well it's going to apply here. So I think that's a decision that could be made, but was to submit written testimony ahead of time. All you do is you, you email the clerk and you can write as much as you'd like. I've told people um, to go to about like 300 words, but that's assuming that you're going to speak it aloud in a period of time of, you know, two to five minutes, let's say three to be safe. Um, you could write, I mean, there's no length on email um, and I, there's no reason why you couldn't attach the map as an example on public record of what you wanted. That wouldn't actually be submitting a map for review by the legislature, but it would be putting on public record, this is what we want a whole county map like this. So that is an option as well that you could coordinate among uh, the league members. Um, so I, I noticed that uh, Reva, I believe asked what our specific, or my specific ask, and I mean, I can't speak for Robert. My specific ask is, is testimony. Um, Testimony sounds uh, dramatic and big, and I, I very much applaud Kathy for, for having like a league map that, that y'all can go into and talk about as well. But I, I also wanna break it down for your specific communities, and that can be even like your neighborhoods. You know, you can think about community in terms of, of a religious group of uh, people that you work with. Um, there are lots of different ways to define it for yourself, and they're all valid. Those are all communities and communities of interest. Um, when it comes to giving testimony, um, you want to give a story. Um, you want to um, describe the people that are part of your community as like a background. So you're talking about, I'm talking about X and Y community. You know, I'm a member of this area, this neighborhood, this place. We consider ourselves a group or like we all see ourselves, you know, as being part of this area. Um, what concerns do you need? If you lived in North Birmingham, the Superfund site. Um, what, if you live in a place where your roads have not been getting paved, what, what are the concerns that you have? I live in Southside, like I said, I live near Glen Iris. Um, our roads flood really easily lately. My car almost got flooded out being parked on the street and it was not a hurricane or anything. It was just a sudden storm. You know, there are some serious issues going on and that sounds like a municipal issue and it is, but, you know, Department of Transportation grants and that sort of thing also go through congressional districts. So think about what is happening in your area, in your community as well. Um, and you can keep it simple. Like what, again, what issues are you facing? And then is there data that you can refer to? Um, don't, don't turn yourself silly thinking about it, but like how far do you have to go to get to a hospital? How far do you have to go to get to a grocery store? How far are essential services in, in general? Um, what are the number of people? Does your area happen to have a, a really low income and it's right next to a high income area that maybe is in a totally different district? Things like that. Um, and then you just 
you just tell your story from there. Um, again, you don't need to make it overly long or complicated. And we're, we're I know I mentioned I'm going to get a um, the flyer out that just kind of breaks this down step by step that's easy for people to follow and go, okay, well, I'm going to put in this part here and this part here and this part here. We're just updating it for Alabama. So I apologize for not having that ready right now. Um, was that uh, too long of an ask? Did anybody have any follow up to that? Well, it sounds like too that just to, I mean, as, as someone who, as I said, is, is just learning about this and just trying to understand like how it affects me in my life um, and, and my neighborhood and my community. Um, obviously I'm in Birmingham, so North Birmingham is, is definitely relevant to me um, and, the, and those communities. And, you know, maybe it doesn't affect me where I live, or maybe it does. Maybe you live in a place where the person you vote for, you feel like doesn't really represent what your community looks like. And that may be because of, of districting maps, or maybe you know of a community like North Birmingham. So I think these are all things that we can do. Um, in addition to our own testimony about this, providing this information to Kathy and Felicia and Robin uh, as they develop their maps and develop their testimony, sounds like a good, uh, a good tr uh, way for individuals to to provide input to you. So we are uh, at time and um, I just want to thank everyone for participating. I know this is like a, a, maybe a little bit of a complicated topic, but it's very important as we all know um, to to voting in Alabama and, and everywhere else in the country and to how we're represented in our democracy, which is something that's very important to the league. So I just really appreciate um, Felicia and Robin and Robert for um, providing input for us tonight. Robin, you came off mute. Did you have anything you wanted to add before? We I first? just wanted to say thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And please stay tuned. Um, everyone I know in Birmingham and Bill are going to get off this call and go, go watch your election returns. Um, please, please stay tuned if you're in the Birmingham area. We will be discussing um, tomorrow morning early, whether, uh, when and where, uh, we, if, if there are runoffs, we might have a, we will have a forum as the League of Greater, uh, League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. So please stay tuned for that. And our October program, and that'll be in September, and our October program um, is, is in the works. It will have to be virtual again, unfortunately, because of the way COVID is, but we are working on um, some uh, maybe a more general presentation about the league and what all the different projects that the League of Greater Birmingham is doing and how you can get involved. So please uh, join us uh, each month as we try to bring you uh, great content. Dana, did you have anything you wanted to say? No, I just wanted to thank everyone um, who presented tonight and everyone who came. Again, the meetings in our area, they've already been mentioned, but just to reiterate, are September 2nd, which is a week from Thursday at Lawson State, and September 7th, which, I'm sorry, September 2nd is a week from today. I'm getting my days of the week mixed up. A week sorry. from Thursday, you're right, it's a week from Thursday. That's right. September 2nd, 4 p.m. Lawson State. September 7th, which is two weeks from today, Jeff State and Hoover. I need anybody who is interested in seeing the maps that are going to be drawn by the league um, or doing some testimony um, to let me know. And I'm putting my email address in the chat box if I can make my fingers work right. Again, thank you to everybody for a great program. Thank you all. And we will, I have tried to copy all the links that I can. I will send those to Jean um, and hopefully we can get a follow-up email out with the recording and, and some of these links to, so everyone can continue to follow this process. Uh, Cindy, if I could just uh, repeat something that Felicia mentioned, which was uh, stories matter. And, and the simplest possible story you can tell is that gerrymandering is demonstrably not equal treatment and state legislators have a state constitutional obligation to equal treatment of the vote. It's in the plain language of the state constitution. Uh, sometimes as complex as the issue can be, especially if time is short, uh, a, a simple story has power. Great note to end on. Think of your stories.
it matters. Thank you all so much and have a great evening and stay safe out there. Thank you all for having me. Thank you.